Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's plenary session. I have a brief few announcements that I'll share with you. Um, the, please check by registration desk um, after the business meeting to see if your bid on any of the silent auction books won. Your winning books will be available for purchase until 11 o'clock tomorrow on Saturday. After 11 o'clock, the books will be sold at the highest bid to whomever claims them. So make sure you definitely check before 11 o'clock tomorrow to see if you won. Um, immediately following this session, we'll hold the LRA annual business meeting. So this is really the time um, to learn about organizational business. So if you have questions about the organization, about um, the, the nomination slate is being announced for next year, so please stay for the business meeting. Um, there's also going to be time for questions. It's an important part of our meeting together. Um, you may have seen out in the um, foyer um, a life-size graphic novel, which has been um, designed and painted by David Landry, who is a Nashville artist. Um, if you have not yet, please check that out. It's going to be integrated into tomorrow's integrative research review session, which is focused on readings and experiences of multimodality. So the um, graphic novel will be part of the session, but we encourage you to check it out before the session so that you can get a sense of what it's about. Um, in a, um, let's see, later tonight from 8 o'clock until 10 p.m., we invite you to attend the Jefferson Street Sounds reception, which will take place in Broadroom Ballroom G. Um, in addition to the amazing music that you'll hear, um, some of the founders are going to um, talk between sets about their efforts to preserve and regenerate the musical legacy of Jefferson Street. So I think that's going to be a really um, interesting, fun event. Um, also from 9 p.m. to midnight, join us for the Vital Issues, which is sponsored by LRA Field Council. Again, a big thank you to Grace Enriquez for um, all of your efforts with field councils. Um, so, it's my pleasure to now introduce you to Millie Gort, who is Chair of STAR, Scholars of Color Transitioning into Academic Research Institutions. Millie. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everybody. I am um, the incoming director of the STAR program, and I'm very, very honored and excited to take on this role. Um, the STAR program is currently in its fifth year, or I should say um, the fifth cohort is currently um, uh, in place and wrapping up their work. And um, I'm going to take the time now to introduce you to them and to recognize them for all of the work and um, engagements that they've been um, experiencing as part of the program. But I want to tell you a little bit about the STAR program. Um, it's a selective mentoring program for scholars of color who are beginning their careers as literacy researchers. The objectives of the STAR program are to help instill a strong professional stance within scholars of color, increase their knowledge of our organization's rich history and traditions, inspire them to continue its legacy of scholarship, leadership, and service, and to increase the pool of viable scholars of color who have been mentored by our organization. It's a two-year cohort model for six scholars of color in the first two years of a tenure-track literacy appointment, who are then matched with senior scholars of color in our field. As part of the STAR program, fellows and mentors participate in several um, activities and experiences, including a post-conference retreat at each of the um, annual conferences during their fellowship, and also in a spring writing retreat uh, during the second year of their fellowship. Fellows also present at a guaranteed roundtable session at the conference um, in the first year of the program and in a guaranteed alternative session um, the second year of the program. The alternative session just happened about a couple hours ago. I'm still um, trying to sort of, <laughs> um, I I'm very inspired by what happened. For those of you that were there, it was a, um, a really, really um, incredible experience and I encourage you to look for these um, sessions in the program if you didn't get a chance to go to um, them this year so that you can um, see the work that they're doing. Um, there's a video that I'd like to show um, to introduce you a little bit more to the current fellows and then I'll formally recognize them.
sorry, we're going to try that again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So that gives you um, some insights into the experiences and the way that the program works and some of the current fellows, but not all of them were featured in that video. So I'd like to formally um, celebrate and recognize them. Um, most of them are here. Um, so if you would please stand when I call your name and also their mentors, I believe, are mostly here. So if you would also please stand. Um, so the first uh, star fellow that we um, will recognize is Dr. April Baker Bell from an assistant professor from Michigan State University. University. And her mentor is Tanya Perry from University of Alabama. Tanya Perry. Thank you. Um, the second fellow that we will be recognizing is Dr. Monica Deanna Brooks from Texas State University. And her mentor is um, Yuri Bauer from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. If Yuri is here, I'm not sure she's here. But anyway, so thank you, Yuri and Monica. Congratulations. 
Uh, the third fellow uh, for the current cohort is Dr. Bonnie Ferrier from California State University Fullerton. And Bonnie's been working with Carmen Kennard um, from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice at CUNY. I'm not sure if she's here, but. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Dr. Theda Gibbs from Ohio University, who's been working with uh, Dr. Yolanda Celia Ruiz from Teachers College. Um, next, we have Dr. Bong Gi Jang from Oakland University. He's not able to be here, but he's been working with um, Dr. Ramon Antonio Martinez from Stanford, who I believe is here, so oh, he's way back. <laughs> And then finally, uh, Dr. Lamar Johnson from Miami University has been working with Jennifer Dandridge Turner from University of Maryland. Is Jen here? Oh, there she is in the back. Um, so tomorrow is our post-conference retreat. We've already been doing a lot of work during the conference in the last um, in the last year, and so we look forward to the culmination of that experience. Um, thank you, everybody. I'd like to uh, make one more announcement related to STAR, and that is that the new cohort, the announcement for um, the call for the new cohort will come out in the next couple weeks, so please look for that in the listserv and also in the um, Facebook page, the STAR Facebook page. So we'll be looking for that next cohort, um, that two-year model. So encourage um, folks that you know that qualify to apply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Millie, and continued congratulations to the STAR cohort. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yolanda Sealy Ruiz, who's the chair of the Edward B. Fry Book Award. Yolanda will introduce this year's winner. Thank you, Becky. Greetings, everyone. I have the distinct honor of presenting this year's Edward B. Fry Book Award winner. The award is given annually to members or a member of LRA who has written a, or co-authored a book within the last five years that acknowledges, event, excuse me, that acknowledges a way to advance literacy, display inquiry into literacy, and shows responsible risk taking. Before I, re I reveal the winner, I would like to thank the members of the committee who were so diligent in the reading of the nominated text. If you are here, please stand and remain standing when I call your name. Mary Avalos, Jennifer Graff, Ji Yoon Kim, Marsha Invernizi, Patricia Isaac, Ileana Reyes, Bogum Yoon, and I would like to thank and acknowledge Marlon Millette, who served as the committee's board liaison. Thank you. I don't know if anyone stood up, but we'll clap for them anyway. Okay. So this year, as in past years, there were a number of outstanding books competing for this award. I am pleased to announce that the winner of the 2016 Edward B. Fry Book Award, drum roll please, is Kathy A. Mills, author of the book Literacy Theories for the Digital Age, Social, Critical, Multimodal, Spatial, Material, and Sensory Lenses. As one committee member wrote about Kathy's book, it is an intriguing, intriguing text that truly makes a unique contribution towards our understanding of multimodality in literacy education. And as James G wrote on the back of Kathy's book, he said that this is by far and away the best guide to this new world. It is the new, new literacy studies. Let's congratulate Kathy. <laughs> Unfortunately, Kathy uh, could not be here with us. She had two presentations in Australia and it simply would not be enough time for her to make her presentations and be here with us and make it back. However, we are honored accepting the award on Kathy's behalf is Dr. Jessica Zacher Pandya. Jessica.
Hi, folks. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm actually very happy to be here uh, to stand in my friend Kathy's stead. She says she's honored and humbled to receive this award, and she extends the warmest thank you to her colleagues who nominated the book, uh, Professors Beryl Exley and Bernadette Baker. Uh, she thanks the awards committee and its chair, Professor Yolanda Seely Ruiz, and also the literacy scholars who have, in her words, gone before. Thank you. In honor of Kathy. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you, Yolanda, and congratulations to Kathy Mills. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Taffy Raphael from the University of Illinois, Chicago, who will present the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award to this year's recipient. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Doug Fisher for chairing this year's P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award. And thank you to the committee members for their hard work. Uh, Finise Boyd, Leslie Morrow, Young Kim, Zoya Pastolia, Gail Lovett, Patrick Smith, and Jennifer Jones Powell. And thank you to those who submitted nomination packets. Awards are only as good as the nominations we receive. This year's recipient was nominated by three future PhDs, Claire Donovan, Sally Durand, and Emily Brown Hoffman. I'm particularly pleased to have been asked to present this year's recipient to my friend and colleague of too many years to mention, Dr. Catherine H. Au. Receiving the Pearson Award recognizes the influence of her 1981 RRQ publication based on her dissertation examining instructional conversations with Native Hawaiian children. The article by Kathy and her advisor, Dr. Jana Mason, helped to establish the construct of culturally responsive teaching. It introduced our field to the concept of participation structures and their potential for changing talk between teachers and students, as well as among students. While hard to believe today, in the 1980s, her findings were startling challenging conventional IRE patterns of interaction that dominated most American classrooms. Further, it was methodologically unique for the time, introducing microethnographic tools and providing a stellar example of their application to the research community within the United States and beyond our borders, within the literacy research community and beyond our borders as well. Her impact on the field began with this article built through her commitment to applying scholarly work to improving instructional practices through her leadership roles within organizations including LRA, IRA, and AERA, her founding of InPeace, a nonprofit that supports Native Hawaiians through programs from early childhood through teacher preparation and from community to educational institutions, and her current work integrating her career-long efforts to support whole school professional development through, standards, through the standards-based change process. One of the greatest privileges of my life has been meeting Kathy as a graduate student and sustaining a friendship and professional relationship since 1978. She is very, very special. I end with a quote from the nomination letter. The quote begins here. The nominated article is not just a seminal text or a necessary read. It is revolutionary. It launched a movement that Dr. Au has dedicated her career toward advancing. As a consequence, culturally responsive pedagogy is a central concern of multiple policy briefs published both, both nationally and by a range of states. Thanks to this line of research, practitioner effect, and policy work that was spurred by this specific article, students from all backgrounds are receiving improved instruction as the field of education continues to build upon the knowledge of culturally responsive pedagogy. And the quote ends there. Kathy learned about this, but living in Hawaii, it made it a little bit difficult for her to get a flight and get in. And so she's unable to be here in person. But she's written a brief statement that will be read by one of her nominators, Emily Hoffman. So, Emily. Thank you, Taffy. 
It is an honor to be here today and read Kathy's remarks. So without further ado, in her own words, it is a rare privilege to receive the P. David Pearson Scholarly Impact Award. Many thanks to the committee, chaired by Doug Fisher, and to Emily, Claire, and Sally for nominating my article. This article was based on my dissertation at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. An extraordinarily supportive doctoral committee allowed the acceptance by a renowned Department of Educational Psychology of a dissertation built on qualitative methods and sociolinguistic constructs. The committee was chaired by Jana Mason, and its members were Ann Brown, Bill Hall, and David Pearson. The article addresses talk story-like participation structures and the school literacy learning of Native Hawaiian children. In 1981, there could hardly have been a more obscure topic in the reading research quarterly. The article raised eyebrows by demonstrating the powerful relationship between culturally responsive instruction and children's learning to read, as measured by proximal indices such as text ideas discussed and logical inferences made. The field has since moved far in its understanding of the significance of cultural and linguistic diversity in literacy learning. Given this understanding, there has never been a more important time to stand our ground in arguing for the role of diversity in literacy learning and against preset one-size-fits-all solutions. I appreciate this award all the more given the American political context and extend my profound gratitude to the members of LRA for all you do to defend public education and work toward the excellent and equitable education of all students. Thank you. I'd like to call on Gufang Lee to introduce our plenary speaker, Barbara Comer. Gufang? Hi. Xia uh, Wuha. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Barbara Comer. Uh, in my doctoral seminar, we just reviewed her book, and I said, I want to meet this brilliant scholar, and so here I am. So how perfect is that? <laughs> so Barbara Comer is a research professor in, school, in a school of education at the University of South Australia. Her research interests include teacher's work, critical literacy, and social justice. She has conducted longitudinal ethnographic case studies and collaborative action research with teachers working in high poverty and culturally diverse communities. Her research examines the kind of teaching that make a difference to young people's literacy learning trajectories and what's get, what gets in the way. She recently published Literacy, Place, Pedagogies of Possibility. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Barbara Coma. Thanks very much, Go Fong. That's a wonderful introduction. And thank you to you, too, for staying um, on Friday afternoon, dare I say Friday evening. Um, it's been a long and fabulous week, so I do appreciate the effort that you've made to hang around. It's also quite exciting for me because I, I know the two Cathys. Um, Cathy Mills is um, a colleague of mine at um, Queensland University of Technology where she's just completed um, an early career DECRA award and moved, moving now to Australian Catholic University. Fabulous, fabulous young scholar, very, very, um, you're gonna see a lot more of Cathy in the future. And I, I need to mention that one of the first times I ever left um, the shores of Australia um, was to visit um, a few American scholars that had inspired me for a very long time and one of those was Cathy Au. Um, so her work profoundly influenced some of the work in critical literacy in the um, 80s and 90s, would you believe, in South Australia. So it's a great privilege to be here, and I'm very excited to be here. 
So I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the Chickasaw, Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek and Shawnee peoples, their elders past, present and emerging, and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. I'd also like to acknowledge the wonderful literacy educators and researchers who are gathered here, and those who have spoken, and those who have been listening um, here at this meeting. And in particular, I want to thank um, some of those folks who have inspired me for so long, including Courtney Kasdan and Alan Luke, um, who spoke so powerfully. Um, yes, was it only yesterday? <laughs> and also many others, um, Brian Camborn, who was my MED Honours Supervisor, who I, I think is probably here, Hilary Jenks, Jackie Marsh, Ken and Yetta, Donna Album and Jennifer Rousel and the list goes on. Um, I think I see our work as a collective project and I think that's going to be one of my messages this afternoon. And I've learnt from those people as a teacher, a teacher educator and as a researcher. And finally, I'd like to thank Becky, Becky Rogers and the LRA community. And Becky is one of the reasons why I'm here today, one of the key reasons, because I so admire her work, the work she does with teacher researchers and the work she does in the profession. And I just wanted to acknowledge that right at the outset. And importantly for our purposes here, the incredibly generative theme of mobilising literacy research for social transformation. How we didn't know that it was going to be so timely, I suspect, or maybe we did. Um, which has provoked my thinking in putting together this presentation. So you'll hear a lot of echoes, not surprisingly, of Alan Luke. Alan is my friend and mentor and was my PhD supervisor. And I want to echo Alan in saying now is not the time for despair. In Rosa Bradotti's post-election piece that she posted online, Il, Il Manifesto, she wrote, don't organise, don't agonise, organise. And I want to run with that theme somewhat this afternoon. This imperative and call to action really underpins the message that I want to get across. Now, I just have to do a little bit of technology and open the PowerPoint. Hold your breath and make sure it works. Okay. It's just taking its time. <laughs> it's up. Oh, cool. Thanks, Sasha. Sometimes I touch things and they stop working. You know the feeling? So it's great that that works. Okay. So is it still working? Hmm. I can't see, right? Okay, something strange has gone on here. See what I told you? I touch these things and they have a life of their own. I promise I did nothing. From the beginning. Yep, now go on. Okay, oh, welcome. <laughs> Good evening. Okay, my presentation is entitled Literacy, Geography and Pedagogy, Imagining Translocal Research Alliances for Educational Justice. Some of you may well be thinking, what's geography got to do with it? A number of years ago now, in my inquiries into schools in high poverty locations, I realised that geography, the social, economic, demographic, environmental and political aspects of place were integrally related to how education played out for different groups of students. In other words, literacy outcomes from schooling, in Australia anyway, differed in ways that related to class, 
location and race. Further, um, pedagogy and curriculum were frequently, frequently contingent upon educators' understandings of and expectations for their students. Sometimes young people growing up in poverty are thought of in deficit ways. If I have a personal project, it's to contest that, particularly in these times when they seem to be ripe. Fortunately, that's not always the case, and I believe we stand a lot to learn from educators in schools where they do accomplish significant education against the odds because they contest deficit discourses and remake schooling as a site of imagination, inquiry, design and action. Making place the object of study, I'm going to argue, can help us to think about how to bring inclusivity, citizenship and critical literacy together, a goal that David Grunewald articulated around a decade ago now in talking about place-conscious pedagogy. I want to argue if we think about schools and classrooms as rich, dynamic sites of negotiation and about such negotiation as unavoidable, the question becomes how do we make it productive? How do we challenge what Soja has described as spatial injustice and what Haberman has named pedagogies of poverty? Often we think of who was, in, who was in the school, within the school walls, but where do they come from? The teachers, the leaders, the office and ground staff, the students, what histories do they bring? How is the school situated in a locale and with what relationship to the wider world? How is the work of school leaders, teachers and students contingent upon the ways in which relations of ruling are organised beyond the school gates? That is, how are people's everyday activities regulated and coordinated translocally by policy, publishers, test makers, the media and so on? How are unequal educational outcomes related to wealth, poverty and geography? In the account of the time it takes a principal, Nerissa, to get to school, researcher Pei Simico points out that this school is not as remote as many others in the Philippines. She then elaborates on the level of disadvantage, disadvantage experienced at this school, including the lack of clean and regular water supply, the lack of ICTs and internet, the lack of teaching resources, and the frequency of, national dis of natural disasters such as typhoons. However, she also points out that mining and logging have also resulted in the loss of natural resources and conflicts between tribal groups and ethnic groups which impact on the community's resources. In my view, these things are not background to what goes on in education. They're absolutely crucial in who we are as teachers, or they should be, and who the young people are that come to school. School leaders, teachers, parents and children come to school with different histories and increasingly with different geographical relationships to the place where the school is located. I want to think of schools as meeting places to which different people come via different routes, trajectories and histories. And having mentioned um, Nerissa's school, I also want to acknowledge the folks going through the aftermath of the Nashville tornadoes and wildfires this week. Um, I know what that feels like to be in a place where a natural disaster closes schools down and actually takes lives. Oh, still working. <laughs> Wave your hands if nothing happens. <laughs> okay, so why geography, literacy and pedagogy? What can we do about the dominance of what I see of deficit, dismissal and denial discourses? Internationally, we see the combined threat of globalisation and neoliberalism playing out in our media and political speak in ways that suggest the demise of democracy as we have understood it. We are inundated with dis discourses of deficit, dismissal and denial, along with intimidation, cruelty and terror. Currently, around one in five children in the United Kingdom and the United States live in poverty. In Australia, almost 40% of children growing up in single-parent households 
live in poverty. How did we get here? Are there possibilities for forming different alliances, I want to ask, to mobilise, to overturn the sp spatial socio-historical injustices that Soldier and others write of? How might literacy educators and researchers work with folks in schools and communities to reimagine and remake better places underpinned by justice, spatial, racial and economic? can't believe it. <laughs> okay, so in this presentation, I outline some of the major problems, sometimes known as wicked problems, that we face that are impacting on how education is designed and enacted in schools and how it might be otherwise. In the first half of my talk, I present what I see as a particularly dangerous set of circumstances, inequalities gone mad. And in the second half, and I better get a move on, I illustrate some modest redesigns of school education, critical literacies in places of cultural diversity and poverty that, for me, offer some hope. And finally, I argue that we need to reimagine our research alliances translocally in order to take action for so educational justice. As Lawson's pointed out recently, 21st century challenges wrought by neoliberalism and globalisation have challenged 20th century optimism about what schools can do, which makes it more important than ever, as others have said. What can we say about this, except to note how excessive greed, privilege and consumerism have brought us to where we are today, where we witness the above phenomena, um, the phenomena I've listed on your screen there, the production of refugees, which is something the Australian government is expert at, the fragility of democracy and the environment, and so forth. In the face of such conditions, how might we build coalitions, as Soja put it, unite in cooperative struggles for social and spatial justice? And I don't pretend to have any answers, but I certainly wanted to put this on the agenda. Okay. So, one of the biggest issues increasingly identified by economists, sociologists, and geographers is the stability where poverty, where poverty is located within and across nations. My fear is that geographies of poverty might map to pedagogies of poverty that Martin Haberman identified in the 80s. A return to deficit discourses and limited literacies for those who most need what school has to offer. But that's jumping ahead. Let's see what we know about inequality internationally. I'm not going to read out all these statistics, but they do keep you awake at night. Internationally, scholars across the disciplines have been wrestling with manifestations of this wicked problem in both so-called developed and developing economies. Danny Dawling in the UK has made some really significant um, observations about poverty and indeed about how governments could make us happy, happier. Some of it's not that complicated. So again, how do we get into this space? I recommend to you that you go online and have a look at Danny Dawling's maps regarding poverty and wealth. And in the context of India, Roy has made some really revealing comparisons which seek to stir our consciousness about what's going on, including with reference to India, she says, as a result of 20 years of the free market economy, today 100 of India's richest people own assets worth one-fourth of the country's GDP, while more than 80% of the people live on 50 cents a day. So what is known about inequality? Those who have a lot of it, as Thomas Piketty recently pointed out, never fail to defend their interest and refusing to deal with numbers rarely serves the interests of the least well-off. Regarding schooling, he recently made the comment that a student's scholastic success depends more on the quality of his classmates and perhaps neighbourhood, we might add, than on the teacher. Now, we might contest Piketty, he's an economist after all, but nevertheless, um, the statistics are significant. 
In Australia, where I come from, one of the most worrying things about this poverty is its persistence in particular places. It's not going away any time soon. And I want to turn to that now. In every jurisdiction, Tony Vinson, a sociologist, recently pointed out, there's a marked degree of spatial concentration of disadvantage. We know where these places of poverty are. Vinson and his colleagues summarised their findings in the following way. Four waves of research over 15 years confirm the enduring cumulative social disadvantage of a relatively small number of localities across Australia. The trend was particularly the case in South Australia where I live. These results are another instalment in the unfolding story of the consistency of extreme disadvantage rankings of local localities across Australia's, Australia's states and territories. So I want to thank Oxfam for their depiction of the elephant in the room. Now those of you who are not Australian won't know that that is our Parliament House. And the elephant's not only in the room, the elephant is completely sat on it. And the elephant in the room in terms of Australia is that the richest 10% of people have the same wealth as the other 90%. And we wonder what's going on with our elections and our democracy. Given this, the UK, the US, Australia are high in the scale of affluent countries with high levels of poverty. So I just want to make the case that it's more important than ever to remember the promise of education as offering a better life for all and literacy's place in that and the need for a particular approach to literacy. Students are going to need more than basic literacy to flourish in the future, as Alan Luke Arts, um, pointed out yesterday. Yet at the same time, there's a relentless focus in political speak about the lack of money, about the nation's deficit. I'm sure you don't have that talk here. And about who will need to pay as if they aren't already, as if they aren't already. The poor, the childcare workers, the jobless, the old age carers, teachers. Okay, you can see where I'm going with this. Don't worry, I'm not, it's not gonna be bleak. But I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room. We need to understand what that has done to our own consciousness and assumptions and what that might be doing um, to the hopes and dreams of the young children or young adults that we work with. So the scary hypothesis. And I just want to raise these questions and then, and then move right along and take you into classrooms. Educational researchers and literacy researchers have been asking these questions for some time, but it may be that the threats to democratic public schooling and safe, healthy environments are now more extreme than ever. And I guess I'm wondering if we could think about um, whether we can learn from that um, global educational reform movement and get it working in the direction of critical literacy and professional teachers rather than a pedagogy of poverty and de-skilling. Okay, so um, before I leave this problem, I just wanted to mention, I think, a very powerful example from, from Jackie Marsh's research where she talks about an austerity literacy model. I think that's a really interesting um, term and one that you know, I'm finding very provocative. And she points out, drawing on Margaret Clark's work, that over 24 million was spent on a particular phonics program, um, with $4 million of government money spent on Read Write Inc. This is the kind of world we're living in, what feminist sociologist Dorothy Smith has described as translocal ruling relations, where so-called experts aligned with multinational publishers and sometimes politicians have seen the production of new truths about the way to teach literacy. Such approaches also thrive, I'm sorry to say, in Australia, with schools investing in a range of mandated programs through school-based literacy agreements which reorganise and regulate teachers' work. It's what I've described elsewhere um, as fickle literacies for children in poverty. 
literacies that look like productive work is going on. They might be holding a book or a pencil. It, has, it may even have the surface appearance of working with text. In fact, teachers may even tell you that this is guided reading and differentiation. But when you look more closely, we can see practices of compliance under the labels of a whole range of pedagogical interventions. Now, I'm not going to criticise teachers. That's not what I intend to do at all. But I want to understand the conditions under which they're working more profoundly than I think I have before and to acknowledge the complexity of new poverty and the kinds of violence that some of the children, the parents and the teachers are dealing with on a daily basis. That changes what goes on in school, inevitably. In some places where I'm working, there are three generations of children whose grandparents and great-grandparents haven't worked. There, are gener there are, is a new generation of children whose parents both have three jobs and they're still poor. So while the elephant in the room is poverty, it's hard to talk with teachers about changing their practice. Now, unfortunately, we have um, something called NAPLAN, which is national testing, and something called Na My School, which is um, school rankings. At the same time, we have Australian curriculum and we have teacher standards. So young teachers and not so young teachers are in, with gra are in the middle of grappling with this particular mix of conditions, which makes it hard to be creative and critical. It makes it hard to get through the day. So, moving right along, I want to take you into a classroom and will somebody tell me when I've, got, when I've used half my time? Can you do that for me, Sasha? Thank you so much. I want to take you into a classroom and a little boy from whom I've learned a lot in the last um, four years, a little boy called Gus. Interestingly, when I gave Gus this pseudonym, I didn't know I was actually going to have my own Gus as a grandparent not long after, so I have to be really careful now when I'm talking about Gus, um, that I don't mix up the two Gusses. Anyway, that's an aside. So Gus was um, a fascinating little boy whose um, teacher, his year two teacher, introduced to us as, a number, as one of a number of children that she was concerned about. His year two teacher was Heather. As I said, we worked in this school for three years. So when we were able to, we realised that Gus is not only in this school in year two, he had actually gone to the, he'd gone to the kindy at the school, he'd gone to reception at the school. There was, a, we thought, a lot of knowledge about Gus in this particular school. So we interviewed the teachers who had worked with Gus in different years to get a sense of what was going on with Gus. Okay, I'm gonna keep this case study short. One of the things that I guess worried me, um, and it's not a new problem, was the ways in which Gus became a subject of knowledge at school. The ways in which Gus, in reception, had already been written about and declared as a particular kind of learner. This was Gus's reception teacher. So Gus, just for those of you who don't know, reception means that he's five years old. He's a task avoider. He's had significant emotional issues at preschool. He didn't cope with the school transition. In fact, I think he never turned up in the end. He was so, so stressed out about it. I've got that here. He will not look at readers or sight words. He can't find an activity when he's asked to or pack up. He would literally just sit there. And kids like that, you can tell there's no stimulation at home. You heard this before? You've heard it before? It's just, you know, you, it's hard to sit there, right? It's hard to sit there. So I've got him down here as, yeah, at the end of reception, he knew two sight words, look and a. It was just like pre-drawing. It was just, you know, scribble. It wasn't anything. Now, the good news is that in year two, um, Gus ended up in Heather's class. And this is Heather's report, which you might find interesting that this is written and sent home to parents, and we could talk about that for a long time. However, one of the things that does capture is that Gus was seen as a different literate subject by year two by teacher Heather. She says to Gus in the report, which is written to him, 
You read aloud in guided reading and participate in class shared reading experiences. You confidently make connections to your life, school, to other books which shows engagement with the text and a high level of thinking. Here we have a different Gus in year two. And then she tells him that what would be great if she could see it next is some um, engagement in his writing. I, I find it hard to imagine Gus and his mother reading about um, recount and narrative, but as I said, that's another story. So in year three, we were very hopeful about Gus. We thought he was at the point of, of really making connections in his literacy. He seemed to have turned it around and his teacher was seeing him in a very positive light. So in the third year of our study, when we went back to find Gus, and he was one of a number of children, um, he had a new teacher um, called Andrea, who'd been appointed to the school because she was a literacy specialist. And when we went back to find Gus at the beginning of term two, because we didn't want to intrude in the first term of the school year, Gus was not there. And when we asked about where Gus was, we found out that Gus had actually been expelled for, and I quote, his behaviour management record indicated an escalation in frequency and intensity of verbal and physical outbursts that resulted in a number of contact parent and take home consequences. So Gus has become a different kind of school subject here, and one that seems um, is, you know, not only is he a school subject, he's actually not there. Um, so it took us quite a lot of time to find out indeed where Gus was. We asked the principal and the deputy principal and it took some time to find out that he'd been excluded and sent to another school. And I guess my question to you is how do we manage to lose children and their parents? I think Dawling statistics on the UK data are very revealing there too and they're similar in Australia. So, interestingly enough, we found Gus at another school where we were doing research. No, we're not in every school, but lo and behold, we found Gus. And we were really excited. And we talked to Gus's teacher in the school to which he was excluded. And Andrea said, Gus neither disrupted the class nor engaged in inappropriate yard behaviour during the 10-week placement. For Andrea, what stood out was Gus's lack of self-esteem and not trying because he was worried about failing, about failure. Nevertheless, Andrea recalled um, that a few times mum, who we had heard was a problem mum, who didn't like to come to the school, had tears of happiness from some of the things that he managed to do in class. So I just want you to think about that for the moment, the extra work that mum has to do to get Gus to one school, his sister to another school, as punishment for him acting out. This is a little boy who really needs school to work. So after Gus, I know you're desperate to know what happened, right? So after his term of exclusion, he couldn't get into the behaviour unit, which is why he had to go to another school, because the behaviour unit was overflowing, Gus returned to his previous school, Sanford. And this is Lara talking about Gus. She says, it's his own inner demon sometimes. I mean, we don't know what negative concept he's getting at home. Maybe mum's got no confidence, perhaps, because, you know, mum's, you know, we, we don't know. Well, we don't, but it seems like we do. You're right, <laughs> okay? We don't, but we do. Mum's, you know. Anyway, we didn't know, and we did ask her to go on, but I'm not going to read that to you. But one of the most troubling things about what Lara said about Gus was that she thought he didn't have the intellectual capacity to delve into a text. Now, we had seen no evidence of this at all. So my point is probably clear, and I won't go on too long, except to show, say that a different Gus emerges in the different relationships of schooling. Okay, now, before leaving Gus and moving along, I want to share with you the one time, the one time in year three where we saw Gus write and draw with enthusiasm. This particular occasion, Gus's teacher had invited him to, and his classmates, to write about and to draw a ride that they would like to go on at the show, which is like a fair. 
so it could be a scary ride. And it was around the same time as Halloween, and they'd read a lot of scary things, they'd coloured in a lot of scary things, they'd heard a lot of scary things. So Gus decided to produce the death train. How many of you have been on the ghost train at the show or the fair? Okay, maybe it's a particular, it's an Australian thing. Okay, it's kind of scary. There are skeletons. Okay, there are dead bodies. There are people jumping out, dead ones and skeletons and all kinds of bodies, etc. However, so this is the most enthusiastic we have ever seen, Gus. And the drawing, the detail in the drawing is something we've never seen from him before. So he was settled, interested and focused on task and he completed his drawing on a double page in his writing book. The drawing depicts what appear to be two vehicles surrounded by a range of scary characters, including people flattened on the fly train, which was just part of the death train, perhaps by the caused by the shock and horror of the ride, and one main highly animated character whose hair is buffed up, a bit like mine really, eyes red and arms stretched out in terror. I killed a man is written in red letters. Now, what do you think might happen when Gus takes this to his teacher's desk? Okay, you've already predicted it. So Gus's teacher gives him some feedback and encourages him to change I killed a man, because obviously that's not appropriate for school, despite the fact that the task is inviting children to think about this stuff and play with ideas of Halloween and Halloween costumes and so on. So it reminds me, I guess, of Peter Freebody's work around interactive trouble, where we have Gus trying to do what he believes is the right thing, the teacher trying to believe that she is doing the right thing. In her view, Gus has gone too far. And here we witness, I think, the development of a dangerous durability of learner identity, a formation that results in the same stories which Cathy Compton Lilly and Becky Rogers and others have noted the same story is being told about Gus and his mum to the point where he announces to us that he can't write. So this is the story he comes to tell. Now, in case you just think this is, you know, peculiar to Gus, I just want to let you know that Lisa Kirvin, Annette Woods and I are doing another study where we're looking at early writing, a socio-material analysis of early writing in the first three years of school. Lisa reported on it. Um, just the other day. And we're working in two schools who are in Tony Vinson's hot red areas of disadvantage and where the schools have agreed to work with us to examine writing. And we've been inviting the teachers and the children to tell us about what constitutes writing now at this particular point um, in their school. And I want to give you a sense of the children's images and see what you notice. Maybe just talk to the person next to you briefly and see what stands out for you. This is the drawings of four, of five to eight-year-olds in terms of um, how they are learning to write and what writing looks like. can see why. Don't worry. It's okay, you want to I, I'm okay. It's just but then once we get to the videos is what I'm worried oh, about. Oh yeah, because I so. won't be able to do it. No, good point. Can you? Yeah. I don't know why this is happening. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. So now what, which one are we on? This one? Yeah. The second one? Yeah. Strange. Hold on. I'm going to have to keep going or I'll be... No, no, you'll be fine. I'm slow. Okay, let, let's, while we're trying to get this um, working so I can, oh, I can see what you see, let me just hear a few observations, just call them out. What do you see? Sitting, 
They're at their desks. Paper, pencils, some colour. We provided the colour. Smiling, in some cases, sure. Say that louder. Writing happens at school. Individual effort. Isolation. Okay, so I'm hoping we're going to continue here yeah. in one second. <laughs> um, those are the things that we noticed too. And interestingly enough, um, when we asked the teachers about writing, are we there yet? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yes. Sorry, everybody, I'm not seeing what you're seeing, so it's quite tricky for me. Um, when we ask the children about writing, you can see a variety of responses, but you can also see a commonality. There's papers and pencils, there's individual desks and so on. One um, little boy was aware also that the experience of writing time is contingent upon a range of factors beyond his control. Yet, as if Deborah Brandt is right, and she's observed that we're now witnessing the rise of writing as text production in various modes and media overtake reading in mass, as the new mass literacy of the 21st century, these kinds of results are disturbing. Now, when we ask teachers, and because of time, I'm not going to dwell on these um, survey results about writing in their classrooms, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, given these schools had signed up to work with us on new ways of writing, the teachers reported the same thing, a real emphasis on daily, um, weekly, emphasis on handwriting, spelling, vocabulary, phonics, sentence structure, grammar and so on. Despite what the stories are told in our um, national newspapers that teachers are all into this progressive lefty stuff. In fact, what we found is that the teachers aren't into this progressive lit literacy stuff. They're into something rather recognisable something that looks like teaching very much about an individual and print and the preparation of the child body for schooling. So much for the 21st century, one might say. So just before I move on, what we found, and I think the children's words on this are really very interesting, of the 200 children interviewed in the Queensland site, where we also asked them to explain their drawings of themselves writing. So far, not one child has suggested that they use digital tools or resources to write. And one little child says, I just think and don't touch anything and listen to the teacher. I get a pen and I start quick. I write big and I put a full stop and then I put another one behind it. Well, you never know, they're a good thing. Let's put in two. And my teacher says, fantastic. Okay, so I, I, without getting gloomy, because it's Friday night and you're thinking, God, why did I stay? I did want, I didn't want to make you think that, uh, you know, we've all got it sussed in Australia and we know how to do this and we've all got it solved and we're really cool, right? We are grappling with exactly the same problems and we have to create the spaces to do something different and it's not easy. So... The questions, what can education do in this context? What can literacy education do and how? How might emergent communication practices be put to work for enabling education? How might schools become safe havens and rich research sites? And can we imagine and enact, and this is a genuine question, enact translocal research alliances for educational justice? Maybe we've got to try harder to get those international grants going to de-germ, detox our schools. So critical literacy translocally, what might that look like as an alternative to germ? And I start to think about here and appreciate the work that people like Alan and Luca and Rebecca Rogers have done around positive discourse analysis. Have we got close studies of classrooms where the teachers are making up a different gus? What's Heather doing in her classroom which allows her to make up a different Gus than Andrea? How do we design and redesign um, in the way that Guti Chris Gutierrez, Gunter Kress, Hilary Janks and others have talked about? And what might cosmopolitan and translocal studies of literacy and critical literacy look like? 
So for me, some hopeful imaginings would be working with cohorts of teacher researchers and their students over an extended time period so we could find out what happens with teachers who do otherwise over time and answer back to policymakers. What goes on um, when teachers, in some cases, are able to design durable enabling rather than disenabling pedagogies? So moving right along then, I'm now going to turn to more, some more hopeful stories, as promised, um, where teachers have worked together to redesign environments to take collective responsibility for literacy, learning and practice. I really want to emphasise collective. I get worried when I see those individuals. I get worried when literacy is about individual data and data about individuals in cohorts. I think we need to rethink literacy as a collective responsibility and a collective practice. And the teachers whose work I'll share begin to do some of that work. I have a few projects on the go which begin to do this, and the one I'm going to talk about this afternoon is Literacy and the Imagination, Working with Place and Space for resource, as Resources for Children's Learning. But I just want to mention one in case it interests any of you. Um, I've just started a little project called Freshwater Literacies, an interdisciplinary international study with primary teachers and researchers where we're deliberately working not only in South Australia but also in the UK to research how teachers might work with water. So moving right along. Small beginnings. So these are my three teachers who I've worked with for a very long time. I'm now, as I've said to some people at this conference already, recruiting early, early career teachers because these teachers have something in common with me, as you'll probably notice. So, Literacy and the Imagination, Working with Place and Space as Resources for Children's Learning. So let me introduce you to the three teachers, Marg Wells, Helen Grant and Ruth Timboli, and tell you a few things about them. These are teachers who work with theory and continually experiment with practice. I'm going to argue that they make place and space the object of study in schools and that that provides rich resources for imagination and expanding literacy repertoires, and that rather than being locked into the local, young people can learn about the relations between people, places and spaces, and imagine other possible worlds. Now, let's hear from the children in Helen Grant's classroom about what they thought about this research project when they worked with her as co-researchers. What might be possible when teachers and children imagine worlds of belonging together. Fingers crossed. My Did you hear what she said? Okay, imagination is who you are. You know, in Maxine Green's terms, imagination is absolutely a political project, imagining life could be otherwise. So I want to share with you then how these teachers worked in a way that allowed them and their children to imagine together. Teachers who embrace theory. So don't worry, I'm not going to go here, but these are teachers who engage with really powerful generative theory. Ideas like Dennis Quek and Courtney Kasdan and Alan Luke's approach to weaving across the curriculum, who engage with the work of Maxine Green and Apadurai, who engage with the idea of curriculum design who read Hilary Jenks and can't get enough of her. So one of the biggest things that I think we're suffering from at the moment 
as what's been a long and bitter anti-intellectualisation of the teaching profession. And I've long argued that when teachers are disengaged, you're not going to have any change happening in the classroom. So these are teachers, particularly who have loved the work of David Grunewald and Australian scholar Margaret Somerville in terms of place-conscious pedagogy. And I've been talking about them and writing about them for a long time. And the questions that guide my research are very much about how material and imagined worlds can be productively brought together, how a material focus on place can open up rather than close down children's horizons, and how children appropriate virtual worlds, play worlds, literary worlds, and material worlds into their writing, and how literate practices can become collective accomplishments. And I mentioned um, in the workshop yesterday that I want to rethink teachers' work and think about it as an extended project, as an oeuvre. I think that we've been really in danger of, in our critical sociology of classrooms, putting teachers in a position where their work was somewhat fragmented and not connected. So I want to think differently about teachers' work. So now to the imagination project. The project involved, very briefly, there's nothing very new or innovative you'd, you'd like about this particular research design, collaboratively designing and planning a unit of work. We've got to make the space and time to do that, right? Negotiating and implementing the design curriculum, collecting teacher and student produced artefacts, debriefing on the enacted curriculum and analysing student artefacts. So it was a fairly straightforward project and there were three teachers involved. I'm going to talk about Helen Grant first. Helen Grant is a teacher who um, works with student activists and filmmakers. As Hilary will attest, when you go to Helen Grant school, the students meet you at the door with their, um, with their microphones held out to ask you questions. I thought I'm going there as a researcher. When you get there, they're the researchers. Yep, you can come in, but we're ready for you. Do we have some questions for you? So Helen Grant and her students, over a period of time, if we consider that teacher as her career as an oeuvre, have produced a range of films, Cooking Afghani Style, Hidden Treasures of Adelaide, Kissing Babies and Pressing the Flesh, which, if I'd only thought to bring it, might have fitted quite well. And at the same time, as well as producing films, this is a teacher who's tuned in to the cultural events that are going on in the community and new literacies. Petra Kutcher's, sorry for the typo there, um, Yin Yang Cafe, Pop-Up Cafes, The Soapbox, What Bugs You, Fiesta Latina Pop-Up. So this is a teacher who's with an imagination. So let me tell you what she does in the words of Helen Grant. On day one, 2015, we welcomed our community to school with the floral decorations and the imagination station, run by students inviting our community to imagine local and global futures for 2015 and writing them on sticky notes. Of the 97 responses from parents, students and some staff, the categories we collated were fun, excitement, people and relationships, grounds, learning and environment, ideas to improve, always improving, in the big wide world, peace and aims for the future. Imagine arriving at school with the children on the first day of school when there's what is described, Helen describes, as an imagination station and here it is. And here are some of her student representative council workers who have helped put the imagination station together. This is an invitation into education made to parents and children from the beginning of school. The unusual object, the cart in this context, and its specific renaming and repurposing for Helen's project also indicates the way she takes a catalytic position in her school. She models risk taking and communication situations. And she did this frequently, materially problematizing business as usual in school spaces and roles through creative disrupt disruptions. She sought to position all students as powerful, as people with important thing to say. So the Student Representative Council, where Helen was the teacher associated with that, 
worked throughout the year to organise a number of events. This particular event was the Yin Yang Cafe, as Helen says, modelled on my experiences in the real cafe in the 1980s in Kathmandu, where they raised 350 for an orphanage after the earthquakes. So these children are both looking in the local and looking in the global. They are learning how to do that and they are learning how to organise social and cultural events in the context of the school. Helen's pedagogies recognise the positive potential in the fact that schools are places that must be negotiated and there is always the possibility of something new in Massey's terms. And turning for a moment to Graham Nuttall's work in New Zealand, and I want for the rest of my talk today for you to notice what it is these children are doing. Because if Graham Nuttall is right and children learn what they do, then what they do is of considerable importance. So if children are sitting alone at their desks, writing and reading as individuals, and that's what they're learning to do. I'm not saying that's not important. But what I am saying is, what's the point in school? What is the point in school as a collective? What's the potential if we think about schooling differently and children as competent? Now, one of the things that um, Helen always does is that they assume that children will rise to the occasion. And the thing about her classroom is that there are occasions to rise to. There is some reason for going to school. So whether it's organising a Pecha Kutcher evening for parents, reporting on the arts, or whether it's organising an event such as the Yin Yang Cafe. And what Helen is always doing is helping the young people to develop a meta approach to their learning and their literacy. So for example, one of the research projects the students did was to investigate the arts and how the arts were taught and experienced at their school. And the way in which they were going to report that research was through a Pecha Kutcha evening. So you have, you're making the school an object of study. It becomes a place of research in its own right, rather than some kind of container where things happen and some children learn. The children are engaged in a collective project of investigating and making. And Helen, for her part, is clued in to what's hot culturally. So, sorry again about that typo. I'm sure you all know what a Pecha Kutcher is. Interestingly, what this does is allow children to do their individual work and then put it together as a community event to inform parents about what's going on in the arts in their school. So there's both research that's undertaken and there's an outcome, a social outcome for their work. This is Jordan's research, his, part of his slides in the Pecha Kutcha, for the work that the school is doing on cardboard sculptures. So something's going on in every school. If children become researchers of what's going on in their school, they're repositioned with regard to the school. It changes the business of the school as every day because it becomes the object of study. The children are the ones looking at it. Let me give you another example from Helen's work about how Helen Grant repositions her students as researchers. And this is a test.
uh, if we had time, I would have seen how many of you knew um, that it was Sudan, but we're running out of time. I just want to give you a sense of what the teacher is doing here. Recently arrived refugee children from Sudan are in a position of making a film where they're holding the cameras and they're telling the story. I could say a lot more about this and analyse it in some detail, but I think maybe this is a time where we can learn from the children. If we had time, I would show you more of that. But what I'm getting at is the teacher makes place the object of study in a variety of ways here. And children are positioned as knowers who can collectively produce a project that informs not only each other, but the whole school and more um, broadly, um, the wider community about Sudan. So to summarise, what does it do? It repositions the students. It works with their knowledges and experiences, cultural capital. It allows them to open what Pat Thompson has called the virtual backpack. backpack. It allows them to work with past and present places. And at the same time, they're assembling new English literacies. This is pretty significant. So if we think of the school as a meeting place, as literacy as a collective accomplishment, we can reimagine literacy curriculum. I'm very conscious of time. I'm wondering, do I have five or not really? Sasha, five? Okay, cool. All right, so in Massey's words then, theorizing space and place doesn't assume a romanticized version of place. It indeed, it makes it the object of study and it makes opportunities for learning and negotiation and invention. This is my argument. And in the process, it creates possibilities for young people's literacy learning. Now, this is a very long story, um, and I'm only going to tell a very short part of it to finish off. For two decades now, um, Marg Wells and Ruth Trimboli have been working in their area to think about pedagogies of belonging and investigate good neighbourhoods. And they're still doing this work, or they were until a week ago. So they're investigating questions like, how important is it for us to have a world where everyone feels like they belong? They're positioning as children as researchers and designers. Children go home and interview parents, people in the local community about their experience of migration children redesign what they consider to be a new neighbourhood with all of the resources that they believe are needed, including various kinds of churches and temples and so on, and in one case an airport for people who might need to get away or visit, because many of these children lead their lives and their families lead their lives across multiple places. Susan Robertson recently wrote in response to Piketty's work that education is at its best when it creates those spaces, opportunities and encounters where a next generation are helped to ask the kinds of questions and engage the kinds of politics that will make a positive difference to their lives and the lives around, and the lives around them. An education system committed to social justice and not market justice would have a radical effect on politics. And I think it's interesting to think about what that might look like. So to finish off, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the work that Marg has done most recently. In regard to big questions, one of the other things that Graham Nuttall says is that for serious learning to occur, teachers and children have to be exploring big questions. Big questions. So with this group of grade four, five children, Marg explored for two terms how do people and the environment influence one another? How do people influence the human characteristics of places 
and the management of spaces with them. You could ask that in a university class, okay? This is ambitious curriculum. These were her notes for the tasks that she, de she designed over the two terms of work in the, with the children to help them understand how houses are designed in particular ways, to help them understand how suburbs are designed, to help them think about what makes a belonging space. The children went on a field study, a number of local walks, and raised a whole range of questions about why it was that there were houses in their local area that had been knocked down and the, van, the land was still vacant some five years later and boarded up houses were occurring. The children were invited to imagine a block of land that they'd like to purchase and participate in an auction. And they had to write a rationale for their particular block on the basis of what kind of a space and place that might be. So maybe it's about safety, maybe it's about peace and quiet, maybe it's about dogs, maybe it's about trees. The children were invited to consider things they needed and things they wanted. So desire wasn't shut down in this critical literacy project. With their teacher, they wrote to Housing SA, the local public housing authority, and asked some of these questions. And as a result, got the council involved, and the council is still involved in working with these children. You can see I'm giving you the very short version here. With their teacher, they designed their house for their block of land, wrote about it, and came up with a particular design for the neighbourhood. I'm just seeing if I can show you that image. You can see them beginning to put it together there. The image of the completed neighbourhood is gone. The following year, when this was still going on, Marg worked with a new class, and those children also designed the kind of neighbourhood that they would like to have. And they, in consultation with Housing SA, they put that work up on the council website, which was very exciting for the children to see their work go up. And you can see what the children said about what they wanted to design and what they want and what makes them happy. You can see the learning that has gone on. In response to this going on the local website, Marg's school principal asked her if she'd been concerned about the grammar in the children's writing. These are ESL learners, they're growing up in poverty. So what about the grammar? Um, to, so to conclude now, given the time, these are teachers who resist datification and the tyranny of templates. They've found out over time that the studies of geographies of place can be really enriching. And one of the things I think that this has done is for me, along with the teachers, is to rejuvenate, if you like, my research imagination. And I'd like to think about how we might design translocal alliances for educational justice and studies of enabling pedagogies that travel. To conclude, what's accomplished? Different students bring different knowledges and experiences of places together. Place knowledge allows different students to be recognised as experts. Children assemble new knowledge via a range of research practices. If we think of the school as a research site, it can change pretty much everything. The school as a site of study, not only a site of um, being poured into. Place lends itself to visual representation through moving images, photos and so on. The artefacts and text can be negotiated and produced collectively. And I'd love to imagine a literacy where teachers and children were collectively responsible for working together to produce new kinds of collaborative texts and old kinds of collaborative texts from picture books to movies. At the same time, the students develop empathy and take action for other people in other places. What's missing at the moment from this and a lot of the work that I've done is an in-depth analysis of these activities in the classroom discourse, the longitudinal studies of the learners and their teachers, the involvement of leadership and system so that these things are built in, so that teachers' work becomes 
factored in, teachers, workers, researchers, becomes factored in to their lives as professionals. And translocal alliances for social action, which is the kind of thing that I think Becky is trying to do with this research project. I think we need an anti-germ movement of scale and it needs to involve more than university researchers. And thank you very much for staying late. Thank you so much, Barbara, for your talk. And now, um, please stay and join us for the LRA business meeting. Folks, those of you who are planning to go to the JLR dessert reception, um, that's going to start at 6.45. So you've got, you don't have to leave this meeting. You can stay for this one and go to that one too. Should I get started? Okay. For whatever reason, I think so I begin by thanking Becky. No, well, the passing of the gavel is at the end. And that's when I thank Becky? I believe so, yes. Okay. okay. Um, I'd like to call us to order uh, for the annual 
business meeting 2016, which is being live streamed for all of those people who've tuned in and are anxiously awaiting with their beer in hand the, uh, <laughs> the live streaming of the LRA business meeting. So we're excited about this um, new uh, approach and we're very grateful that you're all here. Thank you. I'd like to begin with the, whoa. <laughs> Approval of the agenda. Should I just use that? Yes, yeah. just the forward and backward. So not this. I wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the approval of the agenda. Um, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? And a second. Oh. <laughs> uh, all those in favor of approval of the agenda, signify by saying aye. Aye. Woo. Um, approval of the minutes. Um, Lynn Shanahan, our incredible secretary, has um, continues to create these minutes. It's just uh, wonderful. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? They're circulating at the moment, so as soon as anybody's ready. So moved by Elizabeth Dutro. A second. Second by Laura Hansfield. All those in favor of approval of the minutes from the last business meeting, please signify by saying aye. Thank you. And now, um, very briefly, the president's report. Um, I want you to all, I, I just want to recognize that we're going to be submitting a change to the bylaws, which is really just um, to create a consistency with the um, policy and procedures handbook. And that is to clarify what the, what the criteria are for appointing um, people to committees uh, that follows our stipulations around diversity, scholarship, and diversity. Um, leadership, scholarship, and diversity, which was named differently uh, previously in the bylaws. So we're fixing that. Um, we also need to add the Barb Mosenthal um, committee to the bylaws because it's an administrative committee and it has not been in there. So now it's going to go in there. But procedurally, you all need 30 days before it's possible to take a vote on the bylaws. So we'll get the bylaws changes out to everyone with a short explanation. Then there will be a vote, but the vote will happen at the same time that we present the slate which you're going to hear about shortly, so we can all vote at one big time rather than multiple times across the year. Sound good? Yay. Um, second point for the President's report, we have a website. Please go to the website, click around, explore, and, and find the web website by putting in Literacy Research Association, not LRA. Every time you go to LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army comes up. So please, yeah, please do Literacy Research Association. Click, click away. The more we want to get our um, numbers up on that website. Um, the strategic plan. There have been several push messages throughout the conference. If you haven't done so, please add your voice to the um, to the development of the strategic plan. Uh, we've already had an excellent past president's meeting in which there was some really uh, great advice. So this is a membership's call now to really help us understand how we need to proceed in the next five years. Q&A. Questions? Wonderful. President-elect's report. Becky? Let me just say... I'll say it again, but this has been an amazing conference. <laughs> okay, hello again, everyone. Um, just a couple of um, um, items in the report. Um, I think this, um, the conference is going very well. Um, we had 1,100 submissions. We had an acceptance rate of 75% this year. Um, that varied across areas. Um, so I think what I'm hearing from people is that the program is very robust. There's lots of good choices. Um, 
We have over 1,400 people registered for the conf conference, um, and we did um, run some analyses on the um, guidebook, which is our new app, um, and we have 1,000 downloads, which is good because um, I was a bit worried that people would just be using the PDF and wouldn't get some of the features of, of the interactive app. So. Um, I'm hearing good feedback on that. Um, the conference evaluation will be sent out shortly after the conference. Please take some time to fill that out. We do have some new features this year, um, so it's important to get your feedback. Um, we'd like to hear from you about those features, town hall meeting, policy and briefing. We have some changes in the award schedule with the app. Please send us your feedback. Um, um, Gay will be coordinating the program next year, and she will um, uh, appreciate that feedback as well. Um, there is a, free, a frequently asked questions document that's going around. Um, Gay and Pat and I generated that document anticipating some of the questions that often come up um, that just, you know, you have to dig into the weeds to get those answers if you're not involved with this um, on a daily basis. So take a minute to read that. I think it answers lots of questions that come up. Um, and I think that's all that I have for my report. Questions? Okay, thank you. Becky, before you leave the podium, I want to thank you again for this incredible conference. Oh, yeah. And oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's give nice. Give you a poster in commemoration um, of the great work that this conference that's is doing for us, but also what you've, you've really put together. It's phenomenal. That is so nice. <laughs> thank you so much, Pat. Oh, you're going to get a picture. Oh, get a picture of you. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> up here. Okay. Um, and now for the Vice President's report, and we'll be hearing about upcoming conferences. Thank you, Gay. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um, okay. So, um, First off, um, a reminder that um, we have already settled our conference locations for the next three years. So this is not new information. Um, you can see that we're going to Tampa next year, um, Indian Wells, Palm Springs area the year after, and then back at the Tampa waterside um, in 2019. What I want to do tonight is to announce the location of our 2020 conference. Hope you're all still here with us. Um, so I think this year we sent out um, probably around t over 20 um, RFPs and um, got a number of proposals back. And um, in August, Marcel, um, Marcel and Sasha, who's been this wonderful person um, running up here to take care of technical difficulties, and Lynn Hop from our management company, um, took a trip, and I think we visited, um, we did on-site visits to six sites, um, and of those, I want to announce that our 2020 conference will be held at the Hilton Americas Houston, which I think maybe Houston is the first. Texas people, stop giving me looks. Um, we're really excited. This was a beautiful location. Um, we were able to manage a rate of 179 a night. I can answer any questions you'd like about that. Um, the hotel has really wonderful restaurants, and my favorite is Starbucks on site. Um, the meeting space is some of the most beautiful that I have seen. Um, there's easy access um, to area restaurants um, by walking and also by rail um, right outside of the door. And this is, of course, as you know, accessible by two airports. And so we're looking forward to um, 2020 in Houston. Okay. Um, yes, the slate is next. I have one more um, responsibility for tonight, and that is to announce our new slate of candidates. Um, so I first want to acknowledge our really fantastic nominations committee for this year. I don't know if, if they're here tonight, 
but I want to make sure that you hear their names, and those are Tom Bean, Jim Cunningham, Tisha Lewis Ellison, Janet Gaffney, Becky Rogers, and Janice Almacy. So thank you so much for your hard work. I just want to tell you that, you know, you know, the way for you, one of the ways for you to really get involved is not just uh, volunteering for something like the nominations committee, but also submitting nominations. And I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that not many people do. And so if you want to get someone who you think would have a really important vo voice on our board or in the office of vice president and eventually as president of this organization, please, when the time comes, you know, Marcel will be giving the call next summer or next spring for you to submit nominations. Please heed that call and participate in this very important process. So with that, um, I am excited to announce the, this year's slate, um, and I'm going to announce um, names, and if you are here with us tonight, um, I hope that you will stand and be recognized. And first, I will announce the um, candidates for board of directors. Wanda Brooks, Temple University. Yay. <laughs> Shihui Fong, University of Florida. Lori Henry, University of Kentucky. Sarah McCarthy, University of Illinois. Yolanda Seeley Ruiz, Teachers College. Christian Zenkoff, George Mason University. Finally, I am pleased to announce the candidates for the Office of Vice President. Betsy Baker, University of Missouri. And Sharon Walpole, University of Delaware. And as many of you know, Sharon couldn't be with us um, this week. I hope you will join me in congratulating these wonderful servants to the organization. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to welcome Janice Almacy to the podium for the past president's report. Big smile. I um, am pleased to report that one of the tasks of the past president is to make a lot of committee and award chair appointments, and that task is complete. And we have um, many new awards committee chairs and 38 new standing committee and awards committee members. So thank you to all of you who accepted the uh, invitation to join those committees, and we look forward to all of your hard work and for your commitment to the organization. I'd also like to announce that, I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but every past president has a past president's project. And this year, uh, one of the projects that I worked on was to develop a mid-career leadership fellow program along with our treasurer, Gwendolyn McMillan. So thank you very much, Gwen, for your help. And on Tuesday, the board of directors was gracious enough to approve that program. So in the future, look for information about a mid-career leadership fellowship program. And what that means is that if you are a mid-career scholar, somebody who has tenure, or if you're in a position where you are seeking leadership opportunities, there will be uh, three people who will kind of shadow and learn from executive committee members about how to lead this organization. And there will be kind of like um, ment mentoring opportunities with past leaders, with current leaders. So if you're interested in leadership, please look for that in the future from the leadership people. It will be coming out. It won't be me. Um, and finally, I would like to um, Thank you to all of my colleagues who I've been working with over the past several years and to all of you for entrusting uh, my leadership with the organization and for all of the fantastic opportunities to network and 
work with you and for you. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to invite Gwen McMillan to come forward to, to share the treasurer's report. Thanks, Gwen. Good evening, everyone. I am happy to uh, report to you that we are now at total current assets of $1,055,771.99. Of course, that is before we pay the conference bills, but it's still good that we're there. Someone asked me outside in the hallway, are we in the red or the black? So I'm excited that we're in the black. One thing I'd like to point out to you is the, the second line of the Merrill Lynch accounts. That's the Emergency Reserve Fund. We're at $181,250.31. And one of the goals is for complete sustainability of the organization without the conference. Let's say something happens, whatever that might be. We still want to be able to pay our bills and um, be successful. And so Patty Anders has agreed to chair that committee and she's going to get started with me, right, Patty? We're going to get started, and the way we're going to do it is to ask for donations. And so look for those, and when you receive it, please be gracious. And um, we want to make sure that that gets to $300,000. The other thing I'd like to point out is the last line of the Merrill Lynch accounts, which is $20,000, and that's the Trika Smith Burke Plenary Fund. Did anybody here enjoy Alan Luke? If you did, raise your hand. So I want to honor Trika because of her and her donations over the years, and especially her request, we were able to bring him here. So let's just give a hand in memory of Trika. And that's it. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Because our uh, average... Um, the amount that we have to pay over a period of time, like a year, is usually our budget is right around $250,000 with a $50,000 cushion because things may go up as we go. Uh, we do have insurance, however, that will cover if there's some terrorist attack or anything like that. So we do have insurance to pay those bills. But we always want to make sure that we have enough in our reserve fund to cover a year's amount. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yes. If you do, my email is McMillan, M-C-M-I-L-L-O-N, at oakland.edu. You can always look up Patty. So we're looking for suggestions. This is all of our organizations, so please do help us. One thing that I think will help is people who make donations from now on will receive a letter for your tax-deductible donation. So that's something that we can make sure we share with people. Any other questions? Yes, come on, Patty. It's on the website, um, but in addition to that, I have developed some other information, and it's going to go on the, the website as well. There are, I think, five different ways to donate. One is estate planning, and of course, when someone dies, they can give, but there's also the living legacy. If you'd like to establish your own type of award or fund, you can do that. Um, the other way is to donate to any of the committees. You can decide which way you want it to go. Then there's also the general way of doing it. You can also give in memory of someone. 
So those are five of the ways that you can give. And if you can think of other ways, we're looking for those suggestions. So please do let us know. Any other question? Patty? Oh, <laughs> you sure? Okay, thank you. Um, the headquarters report is going to be given by Sasha. Becky, all right. Lynn Hupp, our executive director, couldn't be here with us at the conference, um, and so I told her I would deliver the report on her behalf. Um, we, um, she reports that since the last report of September 27, 2016, um, the majority of staff hours have been on the annual conference. She reports um, a staff change and that Sasha, Sasha Jackwith, who has been wonderful all week, thank you very much, is the primary meeting planner. Um, she notes we have successfully moved site selection from a two-year cycle to a four-year cycle, giving us many more options for adequate hotel rooms and meeting space. She notes that the monthly financial statements are sent to the EC and that the staff handles auditor requests in a timely manner. She notes, as you just heard, LRA's financial position is healthy at this time. Membership Director Scotty Hupp continues to update the membership application and renewal process. The online renewal notices are being sent out automatically via the website. And our current memberships are at 1,668 people who are members of LRA. I'm sorry, there's more. <laughs> I forgot there was a page two. It's not much. At the request of the EC and the board, KWMG, which is the management company, facilitated the transfer of the website data from Wynn Bryant to member clicks. Pat and CISO worked on page content, photo collections and selection, page links to ensure a strong navigation design for the website. Your book, LRTMP orders, are being forwarded to Sage Publishing. Orders for past yearbooks are filled by LRA staff. And now I'd like to thank, with really, there are no words really, Janice's um, contributions to our organization as president um, and as just an incredible leader over the last four years and before that, many years before that as well. Um, and, and then along with Janice, um, other board members and other outgoing members. But first, um, let me just express my deep gratitude to you, Janice, for all you've done. When I look back over the last couple of years and the just vision of what you did and the methodical way in which you put things in place so that we are now at a really healthy place for change, it's, it's incredible leadership. And um, done with grace and determination um, to the point where we were sitting in meetings sometimes <laughs> uncomfortably so. <laughs> but Janice, thank you so much for your leadership. And we look forward to, she's on the hotline for consulting on various aspects of various, um, especially legal documents. So, and she's agreed to stay uh, connected to that hotline. So Janice, thank you. And in, thank you. I'd like to call um, Randy Bomer, please, to come up and thank him for his service as well. <laughs> um, and I'd 
I'd also like to share with you a book um, by Duncan Tonesu, whose work you might know. Um, uh, and this is the book Separate is Never Equal, and your work on this book is also very important. Thank you. Thank you. And Guafeng Li, thank you so much for all the work you've done. <laughs> I know that your work in international relations is also very important and translocal experiences and migrancy. This is a book by Duncan Tonitiu called Punch a Rabbit in the Color of Blood. Thank you. And Diane, <laughs> you get funny bones. <laughs> I've had many good laughs with Diane, and she's brought great joy to our board meetings and great leadership. So thank you, Diane. So <laughs> I don't know. Feel like a Um, and there are uh, two members who are um, stepping down from, or whose terms have, have uh, concluded for their work as chairs of standing committees. Um, some of you may not know how much work that is. It's, it's, those of us who are in the executive get a lot of emails and we realize just how much work is going on behind the scenes. And I wanna recognize um, Kelly Cartwright, who's, I think she's, she's not here. Um, who chaired the Ethics Committee for three years, so thank you to Kelly Cartwright. Um, and then I'd like to recognize Judith Lysaker, whose, um, um, step, whose term is ended for the Research Committee. Thank you, Judith, for all of you. <laughs> three other award committee's um, chairs whose terms have, have concluded are Jill Kasich uh, for the Albert Kingston Award, and it's just been wonderful every year to see this ward unfold. Is Jill here? Um, anyway, thank you, Jill. <laughs> um, and the J. Michael Parker Award uh, Committee Chair, Sylvia Nogueron Liu. Uh, um, again, wonderful um, contributions over the uh, last three years. And then the Oscar Kazi Award Committee Chair, Lori Henry, who is, um, there she is, Lori, thank you. Um, and then we have um, the introduction of the incoming board members. Um, first of all, actually, I'd like to thank um, several of the uh, current um, executive members. Lynn Shanahan, a book for you. So I'd like to recognize our incoming board members, Vice President-elect Marcel Haddix will become our Vice President. Marcel? <laughs> um, I think in the past we've had you stand up, so you just start to make a line. Yes, yes. Marcel, our incoming board of directors members, um, Hillary Jenks. Yes. Karen Wolwand. And Carmen Martinez, well done. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead? And Thank you. Our incoming ethics committee chair is Gerald Campano. <laughs> Our field council co-chairs for the southern region are Stephanie B Bennett and Robin Joykas. <laughs> and
And our um, incoming research co-chair, who um, is not able to be here, is Valerie Kinlock. <laughs> Awards committee appointments include Albert, the, for, the chair for the Albert Kingston Award Committee, Jennifer Jones Powell. <laughs> the J. Michael Parker Award Committee chair is Dun Danita Shaw. And the Oscar S. Causey Award Committee Chair, Aria Rasvar. So congratulations to all of them and thank you. Um, the Innovative Committee Group's Gender and Sexualities ICG co-chair, new co-chair, is Stephanie Shelton. And um, thank you, all of you. Did you get a picture? That's important. <laughs> we need the picture. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to, um, and very happily, announce the introduction of a new program area, the International Research on Literacy, Teaching, and Learning program area will now be able to re receive and review um, proposals from our growing and, and really significant part of our, our membership of the international members of our organization. Um, those co-chairs have been appointed, Lori Asif, Patient Soa, and Katina Zamet are all the um, new chairs for Area 11? So, um, 12, thank you. Um, and now, it's the transfer of the gavel. <laughs> unless, I, I think we're kind of running out of time, so we don't, unless, yeah, let's just transfer that. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to the next year. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Oh, is, isn't that what we're doing? Oh, OK. <laughs> is there a second? All in favor? Aye. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much. Don't forget um, Jefferson Street sounds tonight. <laughs>